Uh, so hi, first I would really like to thank Expodium to, for inviting me and having me, giving me an opportunity to also be here uh, for a while and not just buzz in and, and, and come. And uh, one of the reasons what I really like is also that I think I sh we share a lot of uh, things in which we feel that are important in the way we approach our work and we approach especially working in the city. One thing is this idea that uh, he, you can't really plan the city's top down, for, on which I can elaborate more throughout through my presentation. Uh, the second one is this idea that you somehow need to include ad foreigners and others in uh, also as a as also as a plot, kind of people who will enable you to get outside of your uh, everyday walks or like these elephant routes that you take and you don't really, s you, you at one point stop seeing the city that you actually live in and then you just start like, just like you use it automatically and that sometimes you need a, some kind of a rupture that uh, enables you that these two distance so to get this um, effect like what, what would Brecht say and Brecht is actually some, someone who is I kind of go to from time to time when I need Something that's also don't stare romantically is actually his uh, his sentence that he used. It's uh, in original in German. It's glotznik so romantisch, and he used it as a as a banner about his performances in order to ask people to critically engage with what they're seeing and not to be lured by the form. And uh, this I found is something that is really important in my work. But I also find it is, it is, as an approach, it is really important when it comes to talking about the cities and also trying to see what cities could be and what is also happening to them. Because a lot of things that are happening in the contemporary cities, especially in Europe, are presented as inevitable. And this is something that we need to counteract. And it is also that a lot of the times we just think that what is happening is something we cannot affect. We see city almost as given. I'm, uh, I somehow feel that maybe Netherlands is not that much. See, because you are here so good in transforming the uh, so the earth. So you know, you never know if you go to, for example, Rotterdam Harbor, whether the thing you where it was sea is going to be the sea next time you go there, or is going to be a, a, a terrain, or vice versa. So somehow I feel that. I, I, there was always at least my fantasy, you know, how in Netherlands people understand a little bit better how space is produced because it's so easy for it, obviously. But I think that in a lot of places, we really, without really understanding the processes behind how the buildings are created and how they're made, we, we, almost, at, we almost often s almost see them as, you know, mountains, as if something that we cannot really affect how they are changed. And... Uh, so, so I think so. So in this, so I really think it's this. You need also this moment in which you step, you either you know stop or you kind of see. Or say, yeah, I can actually look at this from another point of view, which is how I feel that my role here is a bit to kind of why I was here to kinda give this a little bit of a distance. But also, it's something that for me was really important because of some of the work that I did, which I will show a little bit l later. Uh, would not really be possible without having a friend from from UK in Belgrade over and walking around with him and telling him, yeah, yeah, and this is this thing, and he was, would tell me, oh, no, but this is different. And then I was, yeah, and this is different, and I actually have no clue how to explain you why, why, how come this happened. And through the search of trying to understand what has happened, it was really a fundamental way of me that to be of becoming the researcher and practitioner that I, that I am. So that's why I think this is, these interventions are really good. Uh, and I think that the, 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 third, the third thing that I really liked in what you were saying and also in the, is uh, this going back to this idea that temporality is important. That uh, so th and also through walking and stuff and that uh, that beside this narrative of grand changes and big plans, 
like the Vinex, in which, you know, it's almost like five years after Vinex started, Dutch government decided maybe this is not a great idea, but what can we do now? We cannot stop it. <laughs> That maybe, you know, beside this idea that, you know, there is a grand plan and we go towards it, actually there are other ways of trying to do. So, uh, I will also have to disagree with you on one point. My presentation won't really be about my findings because I felt that it was initial plan, but I felt that this would be a little bit too superficial. But uh, I would... Uh, but I, I think that what I'm going to show is something that is close. It is really, it's also, it's going to show you the directions in which I'm thinking of. And then this is also uh, a, me asking you here that you're here and then you know this situation here better than me after seven days, although I'll kind of dug a little bit, to also help me figure some things out. So that if you, if you, know something that will close to what I'm looking in and what I'm researching, which are policies, which I realized I, I couldn't understand whether, I, I was not sure about my subtitle, whether it's policy or policies, and then I realized I forgot to, <laughs> to resolve this. So, it's, so there is a typo. Uh, so that if you, uh, so that if you know something that you think it might be interesting for me, please share with me. You can either tell me after, the presentation or we can we can kind of stay in contact and exchange and and i would really be uh, uh grateful for something like that and why policies so uh, uh, and w why this romantic notion so i think that uh what, so one thing is that this this romant the romanticism comes from brecht so this is one thing i expected like this idea of we'll try to look at something with the other eyes. But uh, I think also is that when we look at spaces like Fertport and all these post-industrial spaces that we have around Europe, we also look at them with the notion of romantic freedom and possibilities. That there is still, there is always this idea uh, that, uh, and, and, uh, and I think that there, there are still a lot, that, that there is a lot of truth in this. But I think that the way we have to work in order for these freedom and possibilities to really play out our way and not only the ways of those who have money or those who, are, who have these visions for the city which are almost always played into some kind of a beautiful form or super polished high resolution uh, uh, renderings that more or less always look the same whether you're talking about the development next to a canal somewhere in Utrecht or in Belgrade next to the river or to another. If there's a water, you kind of know what kind of a style this has to uh, be. Uh, so that uh, in order to kind of go past this romanticism, but it also to understand a little bit better the context in which we are operating, that this first romantic notion of seeing the spaces that you've, you know that you can transform, like this unbelievably bull hole through which you have to pass to get into here, that is also, I think what is also important is to take a step back and not look at the physical form, but actually to look at policies and protocols that shape how we use the space. So my presentation will be about uh, couple of examples around the world of how certain type of legislator, leg, legislation and laws and protocols that happen in, in the space shape, this, shape the cities. And all of these, uh, all of these protocols had some, have some elements of freedom, but they also have some elements of, that they generate also not only, they also generate inequality. And this is somewhere where I'm kind of, my work is a lot about uh, looking into the processes in the contemporary cities which are, which are, generate, which are ex excluding people and trying to think of the ways how this can be changed. Because I think that we talk, if we talk about contemporary cities and if we talk about contemporary cities in Europe especially, we are really in the last years only talk about privatizations, we talk about disappearances of public sphere, 
we talk about financialization of a lot of infrastructure and especially of housing and we all feel that we, that uh, the space of of, of our, for us in the in the cities is kind of being narrowed down and that we are and the development that are being planned are really not planned by people who are uh, people who are ordinary people who are living in the cities. And then on the other side, you have this counteract narrative that are trying to counteract, that, that are trying to fight against it, so right to the city and commons. And this is where kind of my first kind of proposal comes through. This is the, so if we talk about protocols and, uh, and if we say, and if we really, if we take really seriously this idea that the, the, the physical space is not only produced when it's built, but actually that how it's this physical space are going to play out and shape the city and shape the everyday life, how that's going to happen around it, that this is already de determined much more in, uh, in laws and regulations that, uh, that are given for this area. And this is now really important, for, especially for Fexport Quartier, because this is an area that is in transition from one specific for from being like in one type of zone with the really specific rules going into something that can be different or it can become the same as the other places in Utrecht. So, so a lot that is going to play out here is not going to play with material transformation of how the buildings are going to change or what type of new buildings are going to be built, but it's going to be played on the level of what is going to be allowed to, to happen or not on the level of uh, the police. And then I was real, it was for a, for a, I was for a long time trying to understand how come we are so good in uh, nominally producing spaces which are for everyone and, and uh, so bad in actually keeping them accessible for everyone and that everyone can use. So that, so that, we, that every, everything, especially when it comes to big redevelopments and urban redevelopments of an area that were former industry or something. So the spaces, so that you always have this narrative, okay, we are opening this and there will be a lot of public space. And then this public space somehow never really fulfills whatever our dreams are about the public space. So then it gets often reduced to the fact that Okay, it's public space. If you want to use it, you have to sit in a cafe and pay for coffee. Question. So, so it already becomes privatized in a certain. And, 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 and then this is always given to us as a community, oh, this is for you. This is where you can come together. This is also a, 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 a space for which you can shape and stuff. And so then I rea realized that there is and that there is a field which is contemporary, which is developing also under a big pressure of finan fi financialization and, and commodification, but that is, that is managing to create some kind of a protocols that enable not a certain type of freedom that we always feel lacking in physical space. And that's pa that is a space of digital, digital of digital networks and what we call digital com digital commons or or so so in the space space of digital so space of digital is completely opposite to physical space when it comes to the questions of abundance so we physical space is scarce uh, digital uh, and digital we see as a limitless and a space of abundance but that does but that does not necessarily mean that, th that these two spaces cannot learn from each other. And uh, so one of the, so, so where I wanted, to, where I was, went to look into the knowledge and something as an inspiration when we think about how we shape through protocols and policies physical space was actually this whole area called free software and digital commons in which, uh, or, or open source, so practically everything that is uh, generated by the introduction of something called general public license. And understanding that this whole freedom that is given by the existence of concept of free software uh, did not come about 
uh, and the community around it that was created did not come about because a programmer wrote a perfect line of code, which then enabled that this becomes so, so genius and so free that it cannot be appropriated, which I'm kind of making it a little bit, but this is how I'm an architect and you can always, you, architects have this idea often, that you know, they're gonna design a space and it, it won't be possible to, you know, to privatize because it's gonna be so, you know, this public space will be so geniusly designed that you cannot really do anything, which of course you can always do because you can always make a fence or you can always put a garden, you can always plant another cafe. So, so to understanding how everything like, you know, the internet through which we communicate because majority of servers are running on Linux, which is free software, which is co creative collaboratively, but a bunch of people around the world who really also care about how this, they, this, are gonna, this is going to be developed and where this is going. So that how all this was not created by someone writing a perfect line of code, but actually by introducing or hack, uh, like tr or hacking the legal framework or the conditions of production in which uh, the code was made. So this person was Richard Stallman, who in 1980s, uh, programmer at, uh, at that time programmer at MIT, in MIT, at MIT uh, who at that, who that time uh, realized that since it was the moment in which personal computers started and a lot of big companies were starting to make software in the idea that you can sell software, that you know, that you're not buying software or getting software for free because hardware is so expensive, but that you can actually sell software. He realized, oh, most of the, I don't see the code anymore. Most of my, most of the programmers with which, with whom I was sharing and exchanging knowledge and we were together developing this new field, went to work for places like Microsoft or IBM and I can't see their code anymore because it's now it became a property of these companies. And understanding that if they cannot share and discuss about the code, the development is gonna, uh, is gonna be uh, development of programming and development of, of, of whole digital realm will actually gonna be all completely controlled only by, the, by commercial interests. So, he created this idea that called general public license, which says if you write something, a, co a code, and you decided to publish it as free software or uh, open source, or later it was also term open source come, and whoever use this, uses this and builds up on this has to publish it, uh, publish it under the same condition like you did, which is this fundamental legal hack which conditions not only that there is a continuous production of open code and open projects, but it's also that there will be a something around which a community can be formed, of community of people willing to discuss not only about this knowledge that they are using and creating together, but also how this knowledge could be recreated and, and used. And this is this, I like this quote, of Stallman uh, who, uh, who said, by working on and using GNU, uh, rather than proprietary programs, we can be hospitable to everyone and obey the law. In addition, GNU serves an example to inspire and a banner to rally others to join in sharing. This can give us a feeling of harmony, which is impossible if we use software, which is not free. For about half the programmers I talk to, this is, a, a, this is an important happiness that many can, money cannot replace. Because I think it describes really, good, really, really well the feeling that we would like to have when we talk about the, the, the spaces we want to have in the cities and the way we want to think of them and the way we want to share them and we want to wanna work. So that's why for me this is, so this is kind of closing the first part of my presentation in which this is something that is for me an inspiration when I think about the future of Ferxpor, but also the future of cities. And this is some, something that makes me draw attention to laws and, and protocols that shape the space. And this is something on, on these are the ideas on which the, the text I'm 
which is going to be the product of my resins, will be based on. Also thinking how then this can really become something that we think through space. And then actually, we have a lot of cases in which we already know how certain laws and certain protocols can affect a lot physics, physical space. And I just made a selection of cup of couple that I will go through, in which both have an op op opportunity, both have elements of opportunity for different type of things to happen, but they also have a really strong imprint on space. The first one is comes from Turkey, Gecekondu, and uh, it's liter the word Gecekondu literally means. Uh, landed over the night and it's actually tied into a principle in which if you build which is actually goes back to kind of going back to the old Ottoman law which says which somehow got s still tolerated in, uh, in ter periods of intense urbanization of Turkey uh, which says if you build a house or a structure from sunset to dawn and move in it won't be demolished so of course, buildings that are built as Gecekondos do not really look like something as uh, something that you would see as something you want to aspire to. And a lot of neighborhoods have a lot of problems. But also this was a legal situation which enabled some kind of an in-between state in which the fast, rapidly industrializing Turkey after Second World War could not attend to the needed, the spatial housing needs of people. So that people, so, but also figured out a way how people can take care of themselves without being completely expelled. So of course, after the first wave of, your, of a neighborhood being built, then you know you start this process of negotiations with the municipalities, and then solidification and bringing infrastructure and everything. And I think this this is also what that is important because laws are always a product of a certain type of negotiation. They are not the laws do not fall from from the sky on people, or they do if people are not powerful enough to enter this game of negotiation. And what I think is the problem is that for a long time we are becoming less and less the ones who can, who can be seen as those who can negotiate what in here. We are being excluded out of this space by people who have money. Which brings us to an, <laughs> my other example. It's a, a historical example that comes from, uh, for especially from UK which was called window tax. And this tax was introduced uh, in England and Wales under the, uh, uh, under the an act for, uh, for granting to His Majesty several rates of, or duties upon houses for making good uh, <laughs> the deficiency of the clipped money, whatever that means, in the 1696 uh, under the King William III. And um, it was one of the first moments in which uh, uh, in which uh, king, kingdom in UK started to address the idea of uh, income and property tax and how it should be relative to the prosperity of the ta taxpayer and uh, without having the and also with the idea that there should be some kind of a redistribution so so at that time, of course, many people op opposed income tax, as now they do. But uh, so this was really some kind of an idea that, you know, okay, maybe we can play it around. But what this law never really took into consideration when it was imposed was what, does, what are the spatial consequences of what is going to do. And these were the spatial consequences. So you probably even, and they still exist. So, be, uh, so because there was a flat rate, so up to 10 windows, there was a flat rate, and then it was progressive taxing. So the more windows you had, the more tax you would pay. Which of course meant that 
poorer people or uh, more greedy ones would start f breaking up the walls so they don't have to pay as much there. And why I'm saying the greedy ones, I'm saying because in the most of the case, this was the, the beginning, and this tax was on power and, until the late in the 19th century, so in the, during the period of the first industrial revolution, so when you had this, when, when there was this big move of people from rural to the urban areas, and of course, most of these people were living in, uh, in, the, in the context, we, in a situation we would call slums, or they were called, Engels called them slums in the housing question, the seminal book in which he was doing a research, he, he reviewed the living conditions of the working class. So of course, the proprietary class who was exploiting the, the workers, and they of course didn't want to you know, have, give them a lot of windows because you know, they would have to pay tax. So in relation also then to the, to, to the uh, sanitation and hygiene and tuberculosis that was part. So, 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 so there is this kind of a connection in which it often happens that the lawmaker makes one law and does not really tie it in to what will be do to the cities. Which brings us to this, we stay in UK for a while, but we are now coming to, uh, to the contemporary moment. Ah, okay, I forgot. You hear, I don't have to. So, this is one of the. So, this is one, this is the real advertisement for. Uh, for one of the new develop housing develop luxurious housing developments in London, and you can see a couple that flies in London, and they go to certain type of shops and browse a certain shop while they're. So I'm just gonna leave you. So, so, so this advertisement like this or leaflet uh, like this for another new development called L London City Island, uh, 
are in stark contrast with the 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 things you're hearing coming from London, how housing is expensive, but how and how there is it's impossible for you know two full employed prof university professors to actually f acquire a home and stuff, and and but they are actually the part of the same problem, and this is uh, this is related again to invisible law, to the fact that if you are a non-resident in London, you almost pay no property tax. Which, which means that uh, with this state of financing in the world in which you know the stock exchanges are not so, so not so stable, gold is volatile, one of the places where you can actually invest or park your money if you're super rich is by buying an apartment in London to which you almost don't pay any money. The, the bubble is all the time in increasing, so the value is all the time increasing, and uh, and apartments became not only a commodity but actually a currency. And this is directly affecting lives of ordinary people in and and con conditions of housing and everything. So 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 and and so so this kind of a something that seems like a so far removed as a type of law actually has a direct relations to the bare, bare like to the conditions of their life of every everyday citizens which is which all, which was also a case in relation to the little research i did and on which i wrote a book which was really in relation to related to the legalization of illegally built structures in belgrade so during the 90s when the whole situation of collapse of Yugoslavia also brought the collapse of the or the whole concept of how housing was produced in Yugoslavia. So you, in Yugoslavia had a strong idea that housing is a right and in combination to the idea that of that uh, against planned socialism you actually we actually had something called this was called self managed socialism and against public property we had a category of collective or uh, societal property or property of a society. The idea of right to the ho housing was that the whole society should so house itself. And this stock was uh, societally owned and uh, and in the late 80s the slowly it started to become private or it didn't become private but a market started to appear on the insisting of Inter International Monetary Fund, who actually uh, came to Yugoslavia in the 80s and in, uh, introduced austerity measures. But uh, so you had for a while a parallel, parallel system, both markets, so those who were affluent could buy, but this was not really disrup disrupting production nor the situation. But then in the 90s, when the states fell, the, when the states fell apart, all new states, the first thing they did, they introduced the law in which everyone who had a permanent tenant right, so they had were given apartment to use according to this right to housing, they could buy off their own apartment. So people became property owners, which radically changed their way of how they see the space. So they say, okay, now this is mine, I can start adjusting it. But what also happened is that because of law, the whole production of new completely collapsed. But there was still need, pressing need for for new new spaces, especially in places like Belgrade, which had a lot of refugees coming. So people started adding these small structures. You know, you extend your about your you build on top of your roof and stuff. So 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 this was kind of, but it was growing kind of larger and larger, and uh, and at one point it started it grew like this. So what do you think is here a roof extension? Okay, I can. Yes, so, 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 you know. So, it, it, so, so the, and this is this thing in which I realize I don't know how to explain this, what, 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 have, what has happened here. This is not, this is maybe not, you know, I'm gonna add a little bit of more room because I have another child and I cannot move to another apartment. Something else ha happened here. And actually what has happened is that uh, mid-90s, when the 
when the when the state when the city realized there is a lot of people living in this precarious situation of in, in structures which were built without construction permit, they introduced the process of legalization, or how it was called, a retroactive issuing of construction permit, which means you would more or less get a construction permit for something you have already built. Uh, there is a whole, not, there is, when I'm talking about, uh, on this, about this research from another focus, I talk about, when, and you know, this, this also had a profound effect on what architects do, but this is not that obvious, but this is, this, but this law then also, laws also change the conditions of how we work, not only conditions of how we live or how the space around us. So what has happened is, because this law was made that you can legalize, and it was never really made super precise what can be legalized. First, Shady and then all developers started using this gray area and started building things which then were not really legal, but they were extra legal. Because no matter how silly this looks, this, is actually, this was actually legal. Or in this gray area, because developers but this also, of course, meant that people living in, on the, in this small pavilion underneath that was extended were, even if they wanted to do, you know, a small transformation of their own apartment, they, co they, were, they couldn't, they were squeezed out by the a little bit more powerful player who was there just to make money. So the law that was made in order to empower, or at least to alleviate the, the pressure of people that of worrying whether they are going to be able to stay in their apartment or not, then actually became a law that allowed a speculation and allowed so much, so much more that even a shopping mall that was built 30% larger was, was able to be legalized. But, and, but this is not really something that is unusual. And it's actually it's not something that's unusual everywhere. It's there are these type of negotiations that you, you give more, which is also the type of negotiations that took place in here, because you would negotiate with people who are living above to give you the right to extend them. And then you would start adding floors in relation to how much space you knew you could sell. But you would also negotiate with the municipality clandestinely to know that you know you cannot really build more than four or five floors because the new urban plan that was being prepared for that area, that area was had a recommendation that these pavilions to be torn down and then you build four stories plus fifth one underneath the roof. I mean, if the roof is a little bit larger so you can squeeze in two floors, they are still underneath the roof. So, so, so it's so. So at one point you could not do this so bluntly, but what actually happened is that for every single new building in Belgrade, even now built, the space underneath the roof is, is for the construction, initial construction permit, a space which is, has some common, well, common use. But after a while, it became actually so, uh, sold as, a, as a, an apartment. And this doesn't happen after people moved in and then decide, okay, let's give, we are not using this space, let's we just kind of use it. It happens while the building is being constructed. So the person buying a penthouse only at one point realizes, okay, why well, have so much paper? Ah, so the part of, I, part of my penthouse is, has to be legalized because it's not really in the permit. So, it's, so this is this moment in which Laws and regulations really have a shape, really concrete physical shape. And how, and, but I f feel that we need to start thinking of how we can hack these laws and regulations in order so that we can have a little bit more breathing space because we also have a taste for exquisite things. And, I will finish with this proposal, which is also building on the whole idea of free software hack, but is also closely related to the public space. There was a court case in 2003 in front of the European, European court, Human Rights Court in Strasbourg, and I decided to include this in the, when, when uh, I found out how human rights is this topic which is really present in Utrecht. 
So the community of a, a community of a small small city town called Appleby in United uh, Kingdom, so United Kingdom, at the court in Strasbourg and on the Court of Human Rights, uh, that they are they are they are because majority of their town center was privatized because it became an open sh open air shopping mall. So they couldn't protest anymore. So they didn't have any more spaces in the city where they could protest. So they sue the, their community or the country that they are violating their human rights to free speech. Free speech, and why, how come this connects to the whole story about hack, like free software? Hackers are probably the best people to analyze the free speech because they, how they protect the code to keep it open is by declaring it to be a speech and that it cannot be commodified and you know, make, made, in, made, you know, prop, made proper, that it cannot be a property of Microsoft because it is speech and speech, speech is free. So it's again trying to find now that you know, the enclosure is, is much stronger that try, so that maybe general public license is not a pro, enough protection to keep the system open and going. It's again looking into the direction of what, what which, which is the next, what is the next law we can hack or use for our. And I think this is this 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 idea of tying in free speech to public space can be something that can be thought of, something that we can use when we fight for our cities, because bottom line is we really need. We really need to, be, to know that in future we will be able to do this together, like people gathered in Warszawska Street in, in Zagreb, and, uh, to, and to tell to the mayor to give up, to give up, the letter says give up, of giving the, this pedestrian street to become uh, an entry into a garage, into a private project, which then it became, unfortunately. But the... the they've put the topic on the agenda that things should not, that, that spaces and infrastructure cannot be private and you have, we have to fight for it. And that also we cannot, we don't only have to fight for, this, for public space, we have to sp fight for, to actually become much more involved into thinking, into shaping of the protocols and laws that are regulating how the city is going to become. Because Actually, it's too late if you're going to start opposing a concrete projects when they start to be built, because the decisions are already made. So here I'm going to close. And if you, if you, th if you know of the rules really which are going to shape Ferg's for <laughs> quartier that could be hacked or that we can brainstorm what could be the dangers, what are the dangers that we could maybe address, I would really be happy to talk to you.